Libya's foreign minister quits the regime. Has Moussa Kousa's defection dealt a severe blow for Gaddafi? And what does it mean for the ongoing battle to topple the regime? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. The battle for Libya took an unexpected turn with the news that Foreign Minister Moussa Kousa resigned and fled to Britain. He's said to have left his post because of attacks on civilians by government forces. The diplomats in the West say it's a sign that Muammar Gaddafi's regime is crumbling from within and are urging others to follow him out. But just how significant will this decision be in turning the tide against Gaddafi? Tim Friend in London has more. The British and other members of the coalition see Moussa Kousa's arrival in the UK as a morale boost when the opposition on the ground are retreating. Kousa will not be offered immunity from prosecution. Moussa Kousa is one of the most senior members of the Gaddafi regime. He has been my channel of communication to the regime in recent weeks and I have spoken to him several times on the telephone, most recently uh, last Friday. His resignation shows that Gaddafi's regime, which has already seen significant defections to the opposition, is fragmented, under pressure, and crumbling from within. Gaddafi must be asking himself who will be the next to abandon him. Until a few days ago, Kusa was the public face of the Gaddafi regime. Now he's being questioned by British intelligence officers and Tripoli embassy staff currently in London, including Ambassador Richard Northam. There are two lines of questioning. What does he know of Gaddafi's plans and state of mind? And perhaps for later, what was his involvement in the Lockerbie bombing in Scotland in 1988, which killed 270 people? In addition to the military airstrikes, they're trying to exert tremendous political and diplomatic pressure in order to wean the people around Gaddafi away from him, the inner circle. Musa will be the first big uh, uh, coup for the uh, Western-led alliance in terms of political and diplomatic pressure. His flight via Tunisia was organized by British intelligence services, seen as a vindication of the tactic of warning regime members that if they do not defect, they will face war crimes charges at the international court. Many Libyan opposition figures believe that should be Kousa's fate. He was appointed as ambassador to the UK in 1980, later expelled after threatening the lives of dissidents. Later he served as the head of the Libyan intelligence agency. And he was also seen as a key figure in Libya's efforts to improve relations with the outside world. A Libyan government spokesman shrugged off Kusa's departure, saying, we don't depend on individuals. If someone is tired and needs a rest, it happens. Tim Friend, Al Jazeera. Well, for more on this, I'm joined by our three guests from Washington, D.C. Henry Shula, a former U.S. diplomat who served in Benghazi in the 1960s. Shula then left the diplomatic service to work for an American oil company that negotiated for the de-escalation of oil prices with Gaddafi after the 1969 coup. From Rome, Hamad Abdul Malik, chairman of Libya Watch, a human rights organization monitoring abuses inside Libya. And from London, Shashank Joshi, associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute and a doctoral student of international politics at Harvard University. Jolton, I want to welcome all three of you uh, to the program. Mohammed Abdul Malik in uh, Rome, if I could start with you. How significant is this uh, development uh, really? And, and is it a sign that the regime is crumbling from within, as some people believe? It is very significant. Uh, first of all, Musa Kosa is uh, a close ally and friend of Colonel Gaddafi, and he is implicated in many of the atrocities that Gaddafi regime has committed uh, over the years. And therefore, for him to, to defect, it must mean that he knows that Gaddafi is sinking and sinking fast. Uh, we have no, uh, no doubt that uh, Musa Kosa's defection is to save his own skin uh, because he knows that if he's stuck with Gaddafi, he is going down. And I hope that this would, even though it, uh, I feel that it should give him some credit, but it should not uh, mean that he will become immune from prosecution for the crimes that we know he is uh, involved uh, with over the years, and not only after the 17th of February, but before that, 
uh, as he was the head of the uh, secret service uh, for Colonel uh, Gaddafi. Shoshank Joshi, what should we uh, read into this? Uh, is this just uh, Kusa trying to save his own skin, as Mr. Abdul Malik has said? Well, Mr. Malik's correct entirely that his, his defection is not a sudden change of conscience. For decades, he has had large volumes of blood on his hands. But I am wary of endorsing William Hague's assessment that this is the regime crumbling from within. We have seen numerous defections over the past several weeks, and Gaddafi will be resilient for weeks to come, I fear, as long as there exists some degree of connection between Gaddafi, his sons, and those fighting on the ground, and as long as they have minimal means necessary to prosecute this campaign, the defection of even someone like Mr. Kusa is not going to change the situation. And I fear if Western governments are telling their publics this is going to be over in a matter of days, the regime is crumbling, we will see a degree of impatience and unhappiness in a week's time when Gaddafi is still fighting on. Henry Schuler in Washington, uh, I can tell from the, uh, the badge that you're wearing there on, on your jacket, uh, which is the, uh, the Libyan uh, opposition flag, where your loyalties lie here. Uh, but uh, I, I know that you're also very skeptical uh, about this whole thing. Tell us why. Well, I'd like very much to believe that it's crumbling from within, but I share Mr. Joshi's uh, skepticism as to whether this is entirely the case. It, I think we have to bear in mind that uh, it's rather unusual that Musa Kusa was able to leave Libya without being detected, especially since his name had been conspicuously absent from the no travel, no um, and, and asset freeze. Uh, that should have been a warning to Gaddafi that uh, something was afoot, that somebody was trying to lure him away. So I can't believe uh, entirely that uh, Gaddafi simply missed uh, the chance to, to stop him from leaving. I'm not sure he's not out doing an errand for Gaddafi as he did all through the, the last decade. So you think then that this could be under the cover of some type of deal making perhaps? I think very much so. He, uh, we're told he's going to talk about what conditions were like or they're hoping to get intelligence on what conditions were like in the state of mind. Uh, and if he provides uh, disinformation in that respect, uh, it will it will make it extremely difficult and uh, to to uh, make a, a reasonable assessment of how the regime is is standing up, and and there's a great danger in psychological warfare, which uh, the British are conducting in this case. There's a great danger of blowback, where you start to believe it. The people that are are waging a, a psychological warfare battle. Uh, begin to believe their own propaganda. Well, Kusa is, of course, uh, one of several uh, Libyan diplomats and politicians who've already resigned or voiced opposition, and it's hoped that uh, his defection will encourage others to make the same move, but he's certainly not the first. The Prosecutor General Abdurrahman El Abbar said he was joining the opposition, and Interior Minister Abdel Fattah Yunus El Abid and Yusuf Sawani, a senior aide to Saif al Islam Gaddafi, both resigned in February, as did Nouri El Masmari, Libya's former Chief of State Protocol. Deputy Ambassador to the UN. Ibrahim Dabashi also made clear he no longer represented Gaddafi, but rather the Libyan people. And Adil Shatout, a diplomat at Libya's delegation to the UN in Geneva and Libya's ambassador to the US, echoed Dabashi's sentiments soon after. And the Libyan ambassadors to France, Bangladesh, India, Indonesia and Jordan also resigned very early on during this uprising. So um, a long list of, of defections that Kusa uh, is joining uh, there. And Shashank Joshi, the Libyan government, for their part, are saying that Kusi, uh, Kusa rather, wasn't, wasn't really that important. You could choose to dismiss that uh, then as a very self-serving assessment. But you could also say, say the same thing uh, about how the West uh, is, is playing this up. Are they, are they overplaying his importance here? Uh, well, they may be overplaying his importance with respect to war termination, as to how this ends, as to how the regime is crumbling. I don't think they're overestimating his importance to the regime itself. Mr. Kusa was, of course, the point man for the West over the past eight to nine years in negotiations over uh, Gaddafi's WMD program. He's been at the uh, center of this administration, the regime, for a while. Uh, he's not, of course, as close as Gaddafi's sons, and so his defection isn't as important as one of Gaddafi's family members changing sides. Uh, but his position in the regime is fairly central. My great concern is 
a defection by itself is not going to bring down this regime. It simply leaves in power those, of course, who are more radical, those who are more committed to the fight. And if you have those who are sufficiently defiant still sitting in Tripoli, there's no reason to think with the rebels hundreds of miles to the east, this is going to end any time soon. All right, let's put that to um, Hamad Abdelmelik. I mean, uh, one, one defection from the foreign minister isn't going to make that much of a different difference on the ground, uh, is it? Well, it's going to boost up morale of the uh, revolutionary forces. Uh, it has indeed boosted my morale. And I think it's also a, uh, well, uh, a morale blow to Gaddafi and, uh, and his inner circle if we believe that... Uh, uh, if we believe the defection of Musa Kosa, uh, I'm, uh, I, I must add that I'm also skeptical because his choice of coming to the UK wasn't a very clever one. Uh, the fact that Musa Kosa came to the UK uh, adds to my suspicion because I think he should be avoiding the UK uh, since he's implicated in the uh, Pan Am uh, bombing over Lockerbie. Uh, so there are many questions to be answered. Uh, many doubts uh, as to uh, the motivation behind his de defection uh, and uh, his role in this. Uh, the fact that he was able to leave Libya, uh, I think, means that Gaddafi has actually entrusted him with a mission. Uh, has he defected, has he made use of this mission to defect, or is he still on that mission? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I need to have more more uh, inside information on this. All right, let's let's put aside your your uh, reservations about his 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 motivation for doing this uh, for a moment, Mr. Abdul Malik, and let's look at just how much a part of the inner circle uh, uh, Mr. Kusa was, and what can he uh, offer uh, in terms of information and intelligence uh, to the West? Do you believe? Well, if he's willing to provide uh, all the information he knows. Uh, he, I, I am sure he is in possession of great, uh, a, a lot of sensitive information. He knows, uh, he knows the Gaddafi regime inside out. He's been part of it. Henry Shuler, what will uh, this mean for Gaddafi himself uh, at this at this point? And uh, uh, will he be considering his own position at this point, or will he simply uh, dis this, dismiss this as just uh, an insignificance? Well, I guess that all depends on whether. He sent him on the mission or, or not, uh, uh, whether he's a true defector or not. I just don't see anything in, in the past in, of their relationship or anything in Musakusa's character uh, over the last uh, uh, 30 years or so that he's been in senior positions. I see no evidence that he would suddenly have a change of heart and, and defect because Gaddafi was, was killing his own citizens. Musakusa was very much involved in killing Libyans uh, as well as uh, killing people all around the world. Uh, there, I don't know whether there's an indictment still outstanding in the UK for the bombing of Pan Am 103, but there is in this country. It's never been resolved. It's a, an active, ongoing case, and the director of the FBI has, has indicated that he wants to see justice done. He was, he was outraged, his word, outraged, when Megrahi was released, and he would certainly not want to see uh, Musa Kusa uh, held, uh, somehow released from, from trial and, and uh, justice in this case, if, uh, if a trial can go forward. Shashank Joshi, I saw you nodding in agreement uh, to some of that. Given what uh, uh, many believe is a very questionable record uh, uh, as one of Gaddafi's inside uh, uh, men, uh, Mr. Uh, Shuler uh, mentioned his alleged involvement in the Lockerbie bombing in 1988. Doesn't the West have to tread a, a very fine line here in how they treat him? Well, they do, yes, but what, what I, where I agree is that uh, Mr. Kusa does know where the bodies are buried. Uh, and nothing in his character suggests he is moving for co uh, reasons of conscience. That's where I agree. Where I disagree is that I think a, an instinct of self-preservation may have led him to make this jump. I think he knows that while the ICC is pending, deliberating, while the war is still at a stage where things are in the balance, if he jumps now, he may have calculated Western governments will be willing to trade justice for peace which is not, of course, a terrible trade, given the fact that this war could continue for so long. He may be uh, uh, calculating that if he offers information, assistance, cooperation, 
he may get a certain degree of implicit, perhaps, immunity or insulation from further action. So uh, it's possible he knows how weak the regime is inside over the long term, and he's making a calculated preemptive move now. Mohammed Abdul Malik, is it ultimately going to take uh, somebody uh, inside uh, Gaddafi's real inner circle, inner circle, namely his family and people within the regime who have family connections to him, is it ultimately going to take uh, enough of them to turn against him, to really turn the tide here? I think the tide has already turned. Uh, I think the bombing of the coalition, uh, the no-fly zone, uh, the fact uh, that there are so many defections within the inner circle. I think Gaddafi is at the moment uh, is being superfi sup uh, superficially uh, m maintained by uh, the huge number of uh, mercenaries that he has brought uh, from Africa and elsewhere. Uh, I think, I definitely think that uh, uh, if he can last long, then it wouldn't be more than uh, a month, in my opinion. Uh, I think uh, Gaddafi uh, is, is over. However, uh, uh, a, a better option would be if someone like Musa Kosa helped us get rid of Gaddafi. Uh, that would have given him more credit. Uh, the other thing is the choice of uh, if Musa Kosa is so calculating, uh, uh, then why did he choose to come to Britain? Uh, if I were in his shoes, I would choose somewhere where I would not be extradited to Europe and if I wanted to save my neck by providing information, I can always continue to provide that information from a safe place where I could not be uh, extradited to the UK or to America or elsewhere. So there are a lot of question marks about his defection. Uh, it is not very clear uh, why he defected, why the UK, uh, why at this time, uh, anyone's guess really all right I want to pick up on something that you mentioned earlier that the tide is turning against him already where do you see the evidence of that because that doesn't seem to be uh, reflected on on the battlefield because while, while the uh, rebel forces are, are certainly uh, not short of determination and motivation they are uh, seem to be struggling on the battlefield they seem to be uh, having trouble gaining whatever ground they have gained and and, and then uh, pull it back uh, not long after that well, the, 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 the strange thing is that the uh, Transitional National Council, I think for the first time, commented on the battle on the ground and said that this is a tactical uh, draw. And uh, what we have seen is that the forces, the revolutionary forces, have gone towards Sirte and then they drew. And what happened was that the Gaddafi forces then followed uh, the revolutionary uh, forces, which exposed them to bombing from NATO or from the coalition, uh, whoever is running the show at the moment. Uh, and if that is the case, if what the Transitional National Council has said is true, then uh, 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 I, I feel that there's been a very major turn in events. I can see here the Transitional National Council and the coalition forces or the NATO uh, uh, operating together and helping one another. The, the revolutionary forces withdraw to uh, lure out the Gaddafi forces and then the coalition attacking uh, from, from the air, uh, which is exactly what happened. Uh, that, would, uh, that would open up the, 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 the way to, to Sirte. So if that is true, then I think it's a very strategic and important move. Shashank Jossi, uh, I know we touched on this a little bit earlier, but what do you think this will mean for uh, Gaddafi's uh, own state of mind here? What do you think uh, he may be thinking at this point? Well, I think it will have a minimal effect on his state of mind. But if I can just return to this point we've, uh, we've just discussed, I'd like to ask, why do you think we are suddenly hearing so much about arming rebels? Why are we seeing selective leaks from the White House about CIA orders to assist the rebels? It's because there is a sense of desperation, a sense that the rebels, despite the uh, benefits of airstrikes and air support, simply are being pushed back in back. So I just don't share this optimism. And that also leads me to think that Colonel Gaddafi will not be unduly concerned by this sort of defection unless it looks like those troops on the ground, the instrument of his repression, are crumbling themselves. And that arm, that arm of his state, looks to me to be intact despite the defection of a foreign minister himself. So uh, unless that particular instrument changes, unless that collapses, 
I think Gaddafi will be reasonably confident he can at least, at the very least, hold the situation into a stalemate for a while. So is it ultimately going to need uh, more military assistance then from the international community to, to turn the tide? Well, it may require some sort of assistance, although I, I again question the easily held and invoked premise that arming rebels will be enough. Weapons are not their only problem. They are also disorganized and lack a sense of strategic direction. We've seen them consistently push far too far to the west and be thinned out, supply lines elongated, and then pushed straight back again. We can give them all the weapons they need, and yet they can still fail to take cert and still fail to push further west. So the question is, can we shore them up just enough to the point where we can push or induce some sort of settlement? I see no other option as a feasible endgame. Henry Schuler in Washington, what's your take on this? Is the uh, international community going to have to uh, step up a bit more here, either militarily or otherwise? Well, I think there's been a certain slacking off in the last couple of days uh, since the U.S. relinquished. And, and I'm afraid that it probably reflects uh, what we were talking about at the beginning of this program, that, that uh, there's a, an assumption that the, or a hope or a dream that it's going to, that the regime will fall apart from within and we can avoid uh, uh, any more bombing uh, uh, of, of, of the supply lines. And, and I think that that's a false premise. I just don't, I agree with my colleagues who don't think we can count on that. And I think that, that uh, this kind of warfare across that flat terrain, I, I would uh, remind you that, that during World War II, Benghazi and all of Cyrenaica changed hands five times because it's just possible to race back and forth uh, across that desert. So this is not terribly surprising, but I do think that they, the rebels need um, more capable arms to combat uh, tanks. They need uh, better support uh, uh, from the air. I'm not saying close ground support, but uh, bombing of supply lines that seems to have been missed out in, in the last couple of days. They were doing very well, but that's, uh, that seems to have slacked off. So I, I think they can be, uh, they can handle it on their own uh, given time, but it's going to take uh, a good deal of time, and as one of my colleagues pointed out, uh, we, we can't uh, get a sense of impatience in this country or in Britain. Uh, it's it's going to be a long slog, I think. Is it also going to ultimately uh, need boots on the ground to step up that military effort? And, and if that's the case, isn't the, the United States and, and, and other countries involved in this, are they risking what's been called mission creep here, gradually getting sucked into this further and further? I don't think that's going to be possible. And the one thing that I've, I've uh, heard all across the board is that boots on the ground uh, are, is simply not an option. And, and I would share in that, uh, as, as anxious as I am to see the Gaddafi regime go, I don't think it uh, would, would justify uh, boots on the ground. There'd be too much uh, complication out of that and too much exposure. I, I think that would be a bad idea all the way around. I think the, the Libyan people can do it if they have sufficient uh, support um, through, through arms and, and uh, even non-lethal weapons like communications equipment, which they don't have now. So I think they can do it, uh, but it is going to take time. All right, Shashank Joshi, if I could turn uh, to you for the last word on this since we are uh, uh, running out of time. Uh, where do, how do you see all of this uh, playing out? Is it ultimately, uh, are things ultimately going to get worse before they get better? Well, absolutely. First of all, I think a, any sort of foreign occupation force would be the height of lunacy. To violate the only thing that Resolution 1973 prohibits would be enormously self-defeating. We should be beginning a diplomatic effort to push the Arab League and African Union to possibly commit to some sort of peacekeeping force. However, this only ends when the rebel position strengthens. They can negotiate from a position of strength rather than weakness, and you have some sort of settlement rather than a what would be a bloody, destructive, and rather terrible siege of Tripoli. All right, we are going to have to leave it there, uh, gentlemen. We will certainly be following all the developments uh, in Libya, both uh, on the battlefield uh, and on the diplomatic front. But I want to thank all of you for taking part in the discussion. Henry Schuler, Mohammed Abdul Malik, and Shashank Joshi. Many thanks for your time.
And thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. Remember, you can join the debate online. You can just email us anytime with your comments and suggestions at InsideStory at aljazeera.net. From me, Hazem Seeker, and the rest of the team, bye for now.